A very good evening, everybody, and welcome to another uh, BEC course, uh, Biblical Education Classes, brought to you by Pantai Baptist Church. BEC is a platform where we can uh, learn biblical, uh, biblical courses, uh, not just necessary books of the Bible, but we have actually been going on a series of uh, system, uh, topics that pertains to systematic theology. Uh, for this season, we'll be doing a doctrine of creation. Last week, we had a a wonderful talk by Brother Yok Ming, who was talking about not only creation, but creation in relation to the human relationship and the spiritual relationship and how it all ties back to Christ, be, to Christ being the, full, the fullness and fulfillment of all creation. Uh, so today we're going to uh, go through the doctrine of creation a bit more systematically. Uh, I will be doing a brief introduction and we'll uh, take home also seven key features of what we should know about the doctrine of creation. Now, why is BEC different? BEC is different because the talk is only for 30 minutes and followed by an hour-long Q&A. This is very uh, different compared to other talks where the talk is coming at like an hour and then Q&A is only 30 minutes. But for this time round in BEC, we would like to, uh, in, would like to welcome your, your questions so that uh, my esteemed board uh, panel of, uh, of brothers and teachers who will be able to uh, address your questions uh, uh, in, with a far more, uh, far more adequately since we have the time available. So, how can you uh, how can you share your questions to us? We will appreciate it if uh, you could. If you have your questions ready and you'd like to ask us, please feel free to use the chat feature available on this Zoom platform. Uh, otherwise, if you can wait until the end of the talk after thirty minutes, you can unmute yourself and also ask us verbally uh, uh, after at the end of the talk. So without further ado, we shall commence with today with tonight's talk on the doctrine of creation. And before that, may I invite Elder Chin, Elder Chin Shi to open this time with a word of prayer. Elder Chin Shi, over to you. Okay, uh, let's uh, commit this time to the Lord. <coughs> oh God and Father, we thank you for this evening. All of us are able to gather again to, uh, uh, to study your word and to uh, 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 to learn uh, doctrines on the creation. Thank you that uh, we are uh, going through our second study on the uh, continuation on the uh, doctrine of uh, creation. And uh, we pray for Pastor Mark as uh, he shared forth uh, from your word, uh, understanding of this important uh, doctrine and how we as your uh, creature uh, 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 created in your image, how we should respond uh, to your creation. So we look forward, Father, for, for you to, uh, to teach us, help us to have an attentive ear and a receptive heart. And uh, we are excited, Lord, what you're going to teach us tonight. Uh, we are going to commit uh, this evening unto you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Brother Chin Shi. All right, so we have on the screen a brief introduction, and then we will go into uh, seven, aspect, seven aspects of, uh, 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 or seven key things about that we need to know about creation. So, in the doctrine of, for, regarding the doctrine of creation, the, just like in what the doctrine says, we are asking the big question of where did we come from? Why are we here? Is there even a creator in the first place? Why did he create? Uh, and what is his relationship with his creation? These are the basic questions which have boggled the minds of men and women, not just for the season, but also for the millennia. So the idea of going through doctrine of creation is also because the Bible is not bashful of such things. It's bold and confident in its assertions. So where would we turn to but our Bibles? When we, come, when we want to learn about our origins. So where would we turn in our Bibles to learn about origins? Well, we will go to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, which I believe that we were, uh, that uh, Brother Yok Ming had shared quite extensively and even go, went beyond Genesis 1 to see the whole relationship of creation and the creator. Uh, but for just looking at Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, we actually have quite a number of nuggets in this, ver uh, in this very verse. Genesis 1 verse 1, 
in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In these one verse, 10 English words, seven Jewish words, we actually learn quite a number of things about God. Number one, God created. Number two, God created in the beginning. Number three, God created the heavens and the earth. And number four, God is not embarrassed by the biblical worldview. Yeah? So God created, meaning creation owes itself not to chance or impersonal forces, but to God who purposefully made us. God created us in the beginning. God created time. He is pre-existent, therefore eternal. Matter is not because matter will come later. When I say matter, I mean physical matter, that the stuff that we are all made of. Okay, so because God created in the beginning, God created the beginning, it means that God is not tied to material things. He's not tied to matter. That's why he, that, that's why he and therefore he is eternal, non-material. God created the heavens and the earth. So what does that mean? It means all the things that we see all that there is, and even the things that we don't see, existence, it, all of that existence owes itself to God. Yeah? So things that we see and things that we have not, that we cannot see yet, all these things were made by God himself. And fourthly, God's not embarrassed by the biblical worldview. He doesn't bury this account deep within Israel's history. It's not in the appendix. It's not something that we, we, we are enigmatic about. It is something that we, we uh, is not even the point where, where God's trying to be politically correct and saying, that, oh, you know what, I'll, I'll introduce it, this later. No, let's soften the ages a bit. Let's just talk about Jesus. No, in the first verse, we already see God's, own, God's authorship and therefore ownership of all creation. And therefore, if you want, and so this is a very bold claim. If you want answers to some of the most pressing questions in life, look no further than the Bible. Look no further than asking God. Because if he made all things, he therefore knows all things. And therefore, we can go to him for help. There is no Christianity without creation. There's no anything without creation, basically. The Bible begins with creation. And it talks about God and a God, a God had uh, made this entire world not out of necessity or nor uh, nor uh, not out of necessity for himself, but out of the extension of his grace and love, so that he we can so we can relate together. And so this is where Brother Yok Ming also went a bit more detail, where we handle Genesis one and two. Where is it poetically, scientifically? You know, uh, is it mythical, or do we act, or should we? sit down and take this piece of literature or this piece of an account of God and take it at face value to say, okay, God, tell us how is it that you want to, uh, tell, us how is it, tell us how we should know about how you made the world and everything in it. But in these four, for all these aspects alone, we already see a consistency in the biblical account for creation. Okay, this what do I mean by that? What I mean is that when it comes to having a firm lens on how we should view the world, Christianity from the very first page, the first chapter, the first verse, got it right. Okay. Now for us, we may also take for granted, yeah, you know, we've, we've, we've had it right. We've always been right. The scientific world has been right, always been right. What, what's new? Well, actually, let me tell you something very interesting. You see, in the days of Aristotle, they believed in a steady state universe where the universe had always been and always existed, uh, had always existed in, uh, in, a, uh, in the universe, not moving, uh, uh, yeah, not, not moving and not developing, and therefore always had been around. Aristotle was actually the one that influenced uh, early Christian, early Christian thought until uh, early Christian thought in in, in the, uh, up until the thousand a up until the thousand A.D. where the Earth, where he thought or believed that the Earth was the center of the universe, and then the sun and the moon and all the other planets and the stars revolved around it. See, 
So Aristotle first thought of it that way. And the important thing is that he, he claimed that uh, the universe had always been in this steady state. Although matter would have an ending because matter degrades, and therefore we should have a beginning. But when it began, it has always been this way. It has never developed. There was no, there was no sense of the unfolding of creation. Then we come to, uh, then we come to in the later part, the later part of uh, Renaissance history, industrial industry, led by Christian and non-Christian scientists alike. We then see uh, Isaac Newton actually saying that, hey, one, what if we were able to see, we're able to notice that the universe, rather than the, the sun revolves around the earth, perhaps the earth revolves around the sun. And then began the conversations of, of uh, going away from the Aristotelian thought all the way until now, where Hawking's Big Bang Theory seems to be the popular uh, model of understanding the beginning of the universe. So in this diagram, we went from a simple diagram that, you can be, that actually can be seen as a decoration on a dish plate to now this beautiful, complex unit, uh, uh, graph or, or diagram which shows us on how there was once a singularity and from that singularity came, uh, came an inf a great inflation and from the inflation and then from the inflation a moment uh, a moment of of the dark ages which then shows a large impact and implode and explode out and from there the galaxies began to develop basically the universe began from a beginning the scientific community had to go one full circle from aristotle back to the big bang theory Whereas the, Christian, whereas the Christian faith has always been very much uh, saying the same thing for thousands and thousands of years, that the universe had a beginning. Now, will there be future contests to this question? Will there be future contests to this theory? Yes, there is. In fact, there is one gentleman that I am keeping an eye on uh, when it comes to my world of apologetics, and there's this guy called Faisal Mir. Faisal Mir is actually taking up the later work of Stephen Hawking, who says that perhaps the singularities can be explained uh, through understanding quantum physics and not just theoretical metaphysics. So maybe the little things that we can see in the, in the space between atoms and how they interconnect, we will be able to see the unfolding of the universe. Very interesting coming from an astronomer. And because he is saying that, that if we can explain that, we therefore don't need a beginning, we then, uh, a newspaper, uh, uh, an, online artic, an online journal actually asked uh, Faisal Mir, he said, uh, where, he was, uh, where he was asked a question, does the universe from nothing means there's no God? Well, Faisal Mir then replies, he's not a believer of any God, for it seems. He says, by, if by God you mean a supernatural Superman who breaks his own laws, then yes, he's done for, you just don't need him. So we already see him to be future contest, but I would say his statement, uh, many scholars, many scholars, uh, both theological and physics will also agree. Um, he's saying a lot about nothing much. Lah, okay? That God that he's describing is not the God that we worship. Okay, He's not a supernatural superman. He is the creator of the heavens and the earth. He is outside of space, time, and matter. And therefore, he has full control of, the, of, the, of this dimension of the material universe. He did not break his own laws. He developed his own laws and unfolded it in his time. And, therefore, and, and that's why the author can never break his own rules. And Faisal also very clearly displays how he thinks Christianity believes in the God of the gaps, meaning things that we don't understand, we just say God. But no, we are quite convinced after much contest and description, after much dialogue and study of the sciences, God is actually the best explanation despite all the, uh, because of all the evidence, not in spite of the evidence, but because of the evidence of the universe. And but I will concede with Mr. Faisal in that we have much to learn. 
we have and we have only scraped the beginning of the, uh, scraped the the study of the universe and the appreciation of the heavens and the earth which God had made for us. This is a picture of a part of the galaxy. Uh, this was using the which one was this? This one would be the Hubble uh, Hubble telescope. Already we can see quite beautiful detail. Okay, here's a star. Here's a here's a major star. Here's a major star, and yeah, here's a major star that is going into supernova, and then there's birth of new stars. And normally we would say, oh, these are the many galaxies and stars that we have. I don't think there's many or any more. Well, in 2020, 2021, there was the launch, there was the launch of the Webb telescope. The Webb telescope is a far more powerful, far more advanced telescope. And instead of just using uh, direct optics, uh, the direct optic uh, lenses, it also uses infrared reading, super sensitive infrared reading. And with that, they might ask, they did ask a question, can we see beyond this white fog that they did not understand, you know, which is basically light pollution. Now they will not be able to see, they weren't able to see beyond this fog that you see here. Well, the web telescope then gives us even more detail. Look at the number, the number more, uh, the, the increased number of stars. There were actually a time when we thought that all this here is basically dark space. There's nothing in between. But if I were to leave my mouse here and just go to the next picture, we can already see that there's even more, hundreds and hundreds of stars and possible galaxies. And remember earlier, we only saw one star. There's actually two. You know, beautiful glistening far out in the galaxy. So there's much more to be learned, much more to be, uh, uh, much more to behold, much, much more to appreciate, and much more to realize that, wow, all these God had made by his hand for his pleasure and for us to bear witness. And in that, we are then able to truly say, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament of the earth displays his handiwork. So very quickly, going on, about, uh, going on to creation, what are seven truths about creation that we can take back? Number one, God created the universe from nothing. There was no pre-existing stuff before or with God. He created the universe purely out of nothing. Not even as nothing, not even as though nothing was, was like something, but nothing as in pure, pure no thing. Yeah. So in Hebrews 11 verse 3, we see uh, Hebrews 11 verse 3, the Bible says, by faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command. Words, right? So in the beginning, God created heavens and the earth, then God said and God said and God said. Though words are immaterial, are, are immaterial, but in God, it bears about great creation, uh, a great creation potential. So by faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. Romans chapter 4, verse 17. We're going through Romans. is also a good passage to think about. God is the one who gives life to the dead and calls things that are not as though they were. God calls things that are not as though they were. So he has spoken things into being. Psalm chapter 33, verses 6 to 9. The heavens were made by the word of God, by the breath of his mouth. So also regarding the earth and its inhabitants, he spoke and commanded, and it was done. So God created ex nihilo, meaning out of nothing. Okay. The, other, the next thing that we can know about, cre about creation is that God created all things, both visible and invisible, both in the heavens and the earth. Yeah, John chapter 1, verse 3. Through him, him being Christ, all things were made. And that uh, 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 all, things were, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. Meaning, the word that had become flesh and dwelt among men, the word that is Jesus Christ, our Lord, was the 
was the power force that actually made all things both visible and invisible. Revelation chapter 4, verse 11, in the great worship of the elders, of the elders and the king, and the king, uh, uh, yeah, in the great worship of the elders at the at the throne, he says, For you, uh, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. The creation of the universe includes the creation of an unseen spiritual realm of existence. So in addition to the, creating the things visible, tangible, physical universe, God created the angels and other kinds of heavenly beings. He also created heaven as a place where his presence is especially evident. In Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 6, uh, Ezra, uh, we see Ezra praying, You are the Lord, you alone. You have made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all of their host. Basically, the prophet said, clear, said correctly and clearly that God made both things visible and invisible. Thirdly, God created time. Okay? Physics tells us that time is a property resulting from the existence of matter. The succession of moments one after another, which is dependent on the existence or a material substance. Accordingly, time exists when matter exists. Since God is not matter, okay, God in fact created matter. So, uh, so, how did God, so how did God exist? He just simply existed. And because he is not material, he therefore is not attached to time. Therefore, by definition, he is eternal. Yeah. So God does not change. Time had no existence and therefore no meaning and no relation to him. Which is why when, he's, when it was said in verse 1, in the beginning, God created the beginning and therefore the flow of time. So what, is, what does this mean? It means that one, we can know something about God in that he's not bound by time like human beings. He is independent of time. Yeah. Not only did he create you and me, he actually created the space-time continuum that we exist in. How amazing is our God. In Psalm chapter nine, in Psalm 90, verse 2, it says that before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the heaven and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Fourthly, God created by his word. The common phrase that we see from in Genesis chapter 1 until Genesis chapter 2, verse 3, we see the word, and God said. Ten times in Genesis account, we find these three words, and God said. The point is unmistakable. God calls things into existence by his word. God literally spoke the universe into existence by his word and created something where there was nothing before. God spoke and it was done. God's word is necessary for salvation as we learn in the first class, as we, as we learned before. But it is also the means to life as we know it. So not only do we need the word that is Jesus Christ to save us into eternal life, but it's that same word that gave us life in the first place. And so we see that God's, words, God's word brings life both spiritually and physically. Yeah. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3 states, By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. So that means God made everything, not anything. God made everything. Okay. Fifthly, creation is a triune act. Okay. Creation is a triune act. This is important, especially in the rising cult group that's tried to, the uh, cult group called, called the Church of God, the Mother. They always like to claim that when God made the create made all of creation, they did not create, they created in the Trinity of Father, Mother, and Son. Of course, they are trying, they, it's an overreach. They are not, it, that is entirely not true. But what I can say is, what I can say is that creation is indeed a triune act. When we read Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, the, we can see God referring to himself in, the, in first person plurality, meaning let us make man in our image after our likeness. God the Father was the primary agent. Yeah, 
We see in Psalm 19 verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God, the sky proclaims his handiwork. But God, the Son, also created. Yeah, John chapter 1 verse 3 says, All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Or even Colossians chapter 1 verse 16, For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And so we read that the Son is the one through whom God created the world. God, the Holy Spirit, also created. He is pictured filling his filling the, the spa, filling space and and the uh, filling, uh, sorry. He is pictured as completing, filling, and giving life to God's creation. Yeah. So Genesis chapter one already hints at the preserving and sustaining function of the Spirit of God. When he says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So we see God created sovereignly. We see God created lovingly through the Word, through, through the Word of God. And we then see God continually transcending and preserving this world by through His Holy Spirit. Psalm 104, verse 30, the psalmist uh, writes concerning a great variety of creatures on the earth and in the sea. And for all those creatures, creatures, he said, when you send forth your spirit, they are created. John chapter 6, we see that it is the spirit that indwells a person upon regeneration, giving spiritual life to the spiritually dead. And then in verse 63, Jesus said something interesting. He says that the spirit gives life. So John 6 verse 63, it says, the spirit gives life the flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the spirit and life. So the Father creates, the Son creates, and the Holy Spirit creates, all of which brings out the new life. Six, God gave the universe a title, and it was very good. Yeah, What's the constant refrain that we see in Genesis chapter 1? We saw that what he was done was good, it was good, it was good. At the end of the six days of creation, God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. God delighted in the creation that he had made just as he had purposed to do so. So, so how, how does this help us? It reminds us that though sin has marred this material world, even to the point of creation groans, like Romans 8.22, the material world is still good in God's sight and should be seen as good by us as well. This prevents us from falling into this false sense of asceticism, meaning we, uh, meaning we step away from material things and saying that all things are evil, we should just be spiritual and die without eating anything. No, no, no. Uh, God, uh, Paul, Paul the Apostle actually, uh, actually applies it very well. Uh, Paul says that those who forbid marriage and order people to abstain from certain foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. This is Paul speaking to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. He's saying that those who practice this sort of asceticism abstain from certain foods which God had made to be good and we should be giving thanks for, he actually says that they are heeding the doctrine of demons. Yeah? Or another author puts it like this, whereas God would have created air filtration machines, he instead chose to create trees. Whereas God could have chosen to cast creation in black and white, he instead chose to paint from a vast palette of colors. Think about it. He gives both water and wine, bread and cheese. Yeah, breathtaking sunsets and harvest moon and harvest moons. God is not stingy. He is not Scrooge. He is not tight-fisted. Creation teaches and shows us all the time how He is wonderfully good, and He is open-handed with His people. He is pro-pleasure, pro our joy. His good gifts are for our gratification so that we might give him praise and thanks. And that is the logic we can see in 1 Timothy chapter 4. It's interesting to, I like the, uh, this uh, illustration that uh, was shared to me by a pastor some years ago. When you want to adopt a goldfish, 
you don't just buy the fish. You first set up the water tank. You first, you then buy pH levelers. You then put in plants. You make sure there's food. You make sure there's correct aeration. You set the environment and then only the last thing that goes in is the, is the creature that which the whole environment was made for. Same thing for the universe and everything in it. God made the whole universe, especially the earth, everything ready so that the last of his creation, humankind, can come in and be, comfort, be comforted, be satisfied, and be in surrender of God's generous provision. And finally, God created the universe to show his glory. So again, Psalm chapter 19, verse 1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they display knowledge. And even the songs of the creatures in Revelation 4, they sang in, chapter, in Revelation 4. It says, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you have created all things. And by your will, they existed and were created. In relation to us, we are designed, created even, to glorify God for his creation. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 6, uh, we hear Isaiah, uh, God, we, we hear God actually saying through the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 43, verse 6, it says, Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. He designed, he designed it all so that he can bring glory to his name. It's also important to understand that God did not need to create to bring him glory. He is by himself already infinitely glorious. God desired to create the universe to demonstrate his excellence. He created to take delight in his creation and creating powers. Basically, he did not need us to be glorified, but he made us purely out of his pleasure and goodness and to display his excellence through, uh, through us and to us. So here are seven truths about creation. That which, uh, that, that which we who take scripture seriously will not, uh, uh, cannot negotiate on these things. That God created the universe out of nothing. God created all things, both visible and invisible. God created time. God created by his word. Creation is in fact a triune act. The universe was very, the, the universe God created was very good and therefore should not be just cast aside as if it was just waste for us to, to manipulate, but rather something that we should appreciate, preserve, and uh, and, and utilize for, for human flourishing. And finally, God created the universe to show his glory. So in this season, so in this season of, uh, uh, so, so in this season where the world is asking the question of whether are we made for this world or the world was made for us, we can then say the world was made for us and the world was also made for his glory. All of this, the earth and we who, uh, we who inhabit it, was made so that he may be known as God, the creator. So that's my presentation for tonight. Next time when we, were, when we are, uh, next time when we come back after Chinese New Year, we will be talking about, about non-Christian views on creation. Because other worldviews and other philosophies will have an idea as to how to explain the ex our very existence, basically the existence of all creation. Uh, we will uh, engage them, think about them, and, and, and demonstrate how, in the end of the day, the Christian worldview actually has a clearer and more consistent explanation on the, on the truth about creation. Right? So that's the talking part of, the, of, today, of tonight's session. I will, at this juncture, I'd like to invite uh, uh, Dr. Jo uh, Brother George T, Brother Yun Tong, say Brother Hui Su, 
And Brother Tony, I saw you were here earlier. And you're here, actually. There we are. Yes. There we are. And we are ready to take your questions. Stephen Hawking said that there was no singularity and no beginning of time. The Big Bang was a quantum gravity event. What should be our response? Okay. Actually, actually, no, actually, as much as Stephen Hawking tries to uh, try to evade away from the idea of no singularity, the basis of the basis of this theory actually assumes that there was a single that there was a single phenomenon. That from a state of that from a state of a, that from a state of mat of uh, of high focus energy that was perfectly balanced in a vacuum, then suddenly bang. Now he is trying to say that quantum gravity was the cause of the unfolding of the Big Bang. He even said that not only quantum gravity but a number of other things happen coincidentally at the same time. But it does not take away the simple fact that something was perfectly balanced in a vacuum suddenly decided to open and avail itself to become the universe and the galaxy that we are in. You know, so to Stephen Hawking, you know, he is he's, he is passed on. Uh, we can say to him that we can say to him that well, uh, the the proof the, the proof will come out eventually, but it will. Oh, but I believe that it will be consistent as to what we've been saying all along. Uh, that the universe has a beginning just by the simple natural understanding that all matter if it has an end it would therefore it would have a beginning and that includes the universe and it had to come from somewhere we would say that is god yeah just to add to that so that concept is like the argument that there's that uh, you know for something to begin must have a cause, you see, right? There's a cause for something to come to existence. For that case, uh, the one that Pasama just explained. Uh, but actually, there's a difference, you see, that whatever begins to exist, right? Begins, like the word, because just now we started by uh, the Genesis 1 uh, in the beginning. So when begin to exist, right? That beginning has a cause. But since God, did not begin to exist. God is pre-existent, right? So since God did not begin to exist, there's no cause and therefore he's the only qualified to be the ultimate cause. That means God is the ultimate cause. Like, uh, you know, he spoke things into existence, right? So where all these scientific theories and all that, they, they want to talk about the origin of the universe, right? In this, in, in the sense of the scientific notion. But what, like, Pastor Mark is saying today is that the creation all right, of the uh, uh, the universe is a theological concept, right? Whereas scientific is the origin, right? How the, the origin began, the Big Bang and all that. But here we're talking about the creation of you know of, of the universe, right? Not just the origin, but the whole creation. And God is the there for the ultimate cause because his pre-existence is from beginning. From beginning, he's already there. All right. So when we talk about cause, he said when something begins to exist. That's a cause, but God is the ultimate cause, you know. So that's how sometimes all these scientific things, a Big Bang, and even uh, talk about uh, later on, you talk about you know Charles Darwin and all that, right? And when Charles Darwin tried to avoid the fact that the, of the creation, he talked about the origin of species, right? But not the creation. He avoided all the time all his theory. He avoided the creation part of aspects of uh, a being. You see. Yeah. Can I just give a humorous uh, story? Yes. Yeah, we need a, a joke. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There was a group of scientists, say many, many years into the future, they, they have perfected the art of creation. Okay. They were able to create many things. So one day they called a conference with God. And he, they, they told God, you, you may have created some things, but we can also create. See, God said, what can you create? We can also create human beings. Oh, God said, then show me. Then 
the scientists asked the lab assistant to go and collect some earth from the garden. Then God said, no, find your own soil. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so they had to use yeah. the a created that was already created by God. Yeah, yeah. Because they, yeah. you are so good, create your own soil. Go find yeah. your own soil. That's right. That, that goes to show that God is the uncaused cause. Correct, correct. He yeah. is able uncaused. to cause everything ex nihilo. Yeah? He, yeah. he spoke things into being. Yeah, From yeah. nothing came everything. Seen and Correct. unseen. Correct. In heaven, on earth, and below the earth, and under the sea as well. Including principalities and powers of darkness. Yeah. 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 Just now, yeah, yeah, you mentioned a few times about creation, uh, ex nihilo. It right? means the creatio mm -hmm. in Latin, ex nihilo means out, mm -hmm. existing out of nothing. Mm -hmm. But there also there's this important concept that creatio continua. Because God is also right now continuing, you know, uh, what I call in a uh, uh, creation, whether invisible or visible, right? Uh, mm. You know, we know that, you know, it's expanding. That's also work of creation. So it's creatio continua. And very importantly, we look forward to one more thing. is creatio nova. The new mm. creation, ultimately, we look forward that. The ultimate creation of the new heaven and the new earth, right? It's also going to be God's work, you know. So, mm -hmm. creation, uh, new, uh, Nova, which is uh, ultimately uh, the brand new one which we're going to look at in the future, right? Mm -hmm. We look forward to that thing. Colossians one seventeen says that yeah. Jesus is the one who is sustaining the earth Correct. the whole Amen. universe right now. Yeah. If going we one day one... wake up without the sun, then, then yeah. it shows that that's the end of the world. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> Going from what Brother Tony mentioned, that it, that both that, that everything in the earth and both that we see to be good and evil, all has its place under under the under God's under God's creative creative and creator position. Yeah. So I think we can ask this question next. Is Satan also a creation of God? If yes, why is he evil? I think to start the ball rolling, I think it's very clear. Yes, Satan is a creation. Yeah. Uh, and make no mistake, and make no mistake, brothers and sisters, Satan is not the opposite of God. Mm -hmm. Cannot nothing can be opposite of God. Because to say that something is opposite of God, assume that he assumes that the opposite has equal but contra but contradicting power. Yeah. Right. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, equal and opposing power. And we will not say that Satan has equal and opposing power to God. Yeah. So he is created. Yeah. He is evil by his own free will. Satan is evil by his own free will. He had decided, he had decided himself to be more superior than God, uh, 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 more superior than God, and hence and has God had banished him out of uh, uh, out of his presence. Yeah. Yeah, just now, Pastor Mark did mention about uh, be invisible beings, right? So he's a uh, creation of invisible is like angels, okay? Actually, uh, uh, Satan is a fallen angel, Lucifer, right? He fell because, like Pastor Mark says, he rebelled against God and wanted to be like God, right? So he's actually a fallen created being, right? Not, not the opposite of God. So the word Satan actually means adversary, right? Everything that God does, he wants to oppose. It's the opposition, you know, uh, in that in that sense. So his his name is just means an adversary. So he's a created being, a fallen angel, not not uh, equal to God, not not in the sense of uh, 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 equal to God or or uh, just opposing God, yeah, and rebellion against God. Yeah. I think I think we <coughs> we uh, we must agree that. Uh, Satan is not equal to God. I think yeah, Satan is a great is a creation from God, you see. So yeah. they, it's just like God created human being. Uh, so we 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 see human being, it, that is the ten, I mean uh, basically a physical form. Okay. Then God also created some uh, heavenly being which is in spiritual form. Yeah. You ask yourself why human being where we where we 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 sin is because 
as a result of rebellion, results of, as a result of disobedience. And the same thing can also happen to the heavenly beings. See? And Satan is one of those heavenly beings who had uh, rebels against God. There are still other he heavenly beings who are still very faithful. They continue to glorify God. So, so it's just one of the many of the spiritual beings created by God who have turned, you might say, turned bad, you know. I mean, yeah. you have to think it that way. Uh, then Satan is also capable of evil. Yeah. And when Satan fell, he brought along one third of the angels with him. Is there a difference between what God created as good and that which was very good in Genesis 1? So yeah. this is a hermeneutic question. Yeah. So 10 times between chapter 1, verse 1 to uh, verse 29, uh, the word good was, was, mentioned 50, was mentioned 10 times. But then in Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, when God saw all creation, it was very good. What yeah. does that mean? You know, does that mean that now that 31 is very good, it, that it was very good, does that mean that the uh, rest creation before was not really that good? So what do we mean by that? Okay. Uh, yeah, actually just to, to mention, okay, uh, the word good appears actually six times, like, yeah, okay, uh, in verse three, verse three, verse 12, uh, verse uh, 18, verse uh, 21 and verse uh, 25, okay? And when it comes to very good, it is in verse uh, 31, okay? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, uh, whether you say it's coincidental or not, but we, we can say that actually human being is a crown of God's creation, mm -hmm. okay? Is the penultimate, the crown, the jewel of God's creation, and before that, all those things that he created were, you know, uh, uh, things are good. Uh, right? But when it came to creation of human beings, right after that, and more importantly, right after the word, right, he created, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Out. This is a very important thing. Male and female, he created them. And, you know, right after that, it was described as very good. Mm. So I think this is really the penultimate where, where God created uh, human beings, uh, male and female, to reflect uh, the triune God, uh, the, so to speak, the relationship community. Uh, and, and, and important thing, male and female. There are no other things, right? Just male and female. Mm. No? And, and because of that, why male and female? Because he says that be fruitful and multiply, right? Fill the earth, subdue it, and have dominion on it. And so that is the mandate given to male and female, right? Just male alone, he cannot fruitful and multiply. But with the female, then we know that, right? Can be fruitful and multiply and have dominion over all you know, the created beings. So I think uh, it's, uh, you can say it's very good when it is... Uh, that God created the crown of, you know, considered human beings as uh, his jewel in uh, the whole of the creation, the penultimate, and importantly reflects the male and female part of the creation. Mm. I, <clears throat> I want to throw in a little bit from another angle. Yeah. I think the first few days that God created the things and he described it at the end of the day, as good and good and good and good. And on the final day after creating human beings, he declared that it was very good. Yeah. So to me, I think is uh, something related to synergy, isn't it? One plus one equals more than two. Yeah. So every day it was already a com complete good creation. When yeah. you mix up all the two, all the six days of uh, creation, and then the ultimate is not the penultimate. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> the ultimate, okay. is the, ultimate yeah. is the, the zenith, yeah. is the top, yeah. the apex okay. of God's creation. So when you throw all these things in, there is this synergistic kind of combination 
That's yeah. why God has to declare that it was very good. Mm -hmm. So it's not that the others were not good at all, yeah. the inferior, but when you put them all in the mix, it comes up something which is even more perfect. Mm -hmm. That's my angle of it. Yeah, okay. That's I, a good angle. I think from the biblical, uh, from the Bible, especially in uh, chapter 1, uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, now you realize that when God created all the animals, uh, trees and plants and so on, he pronounced that it is good. Yeah. You see, the creation of man is very, very special. It's absolutely special. And that's, uh, that's why in verse 26, it said, then God said, let us make man in our own image, yeah. in our own likeness. And that then what do they do? They will rule over the fish of yes. the sea and the birds of the air and over livestock, over all the earth and over all the creatures that move on, on the ground. The What God has created earlier now is put in charge by this spatial yes. creation in the form of man. Is yes. it? And after that, God created man in his own image, of course, yeah. uh, both male and female. And that is the reason why he pronounced that it is very good. Yeah, okay. Man is creation of man is very special. He has yeah. a special function. It's rule over all the other creation which God has made. Yeah. Okay. I think, yeah, I agree with John. Uh, a, a, a quick uh, he, a quick uh, a quick Hebrew word study. Uh, the word the, the word good is tov, and tov is normally used to denote something either that is moral, that there is of moral value, or uh, or positive value, or uh, purposeful value. So this is not so. Uh, like I mentioned in one of my sermons before, uh, you can describe a knife to be good because it's able to fulfill its purpose. And in order for it to fulfill its purpose, it must have certain attributes. It must be straight line, it must be sharp, it must have a good handle of certain quality, not in, no rust and so on and so forth. So, tof, good knife, yeah? But then, yeah. when you use, when you hear the word tof meod, okay, the, which basically means good, very, or uh, bagus sangat, it means that it is completely ready for its purpose. So something that is good, it's ready for, uh, meaning it can be used and has a purpose, a meaning, a, a nature of goodness itself. But when God said, this is very good, means he looked at all of creation and says, now you are complete and ready for my purpose. Yeah. So I, I do appreciate how Brother Huizu mentioned that male and female, because if male alone with no female is incomplete, in fact, in the whole Genesis chapter 2, we can see how God, how God allowed Adam to be alone for a while. He named all the animals and he saw all of them but male and female and basically he's asking himself, hey God, where's mine? So incomplete yet until 131. And then when he made Eve for Adam, man, uh, uh, man and woman together, then it is completely ready for purpose. Yeah. Yeah. And so... Uh, even Brother George and Brother uh, 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 Brother Tony's uh, expression expression of how the uh, of the special nature of humanity and therefore a special purpose also depicts how not only is this tof but tof mayor. Bukan saja bagus tapi bagus sangat. Not just good but very good. The use of tof mayor is also consistent. With uh, how uh, on other other parts of scripture where 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 ah this is very good so that means it's in uh, it's in a uh, it's in an idea where it's completely ready. And just to add a little bit, you know, the first three day of creation, you can call it um, like forming stage uh, because God form right and make things out of, uh, out of nothing, but He form things. He separate light from darkness, right? Separate land from sky from the sea and those separate and thirdly separate land from the water mm. right and then the next three days is all feeling right uh from forming to feeling feel uh, the the the, uh, uh, the sea with fish and then the land with birds and uh, you know uh, i mean the creatures yeah and 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 then the birds of the uh, air as well to feel and of course finally like george has mentioned that ultimately he wants 
the, 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 the creation mandate to be given to uh, the, the man to feel, right? To feel the earth and subdue and have dominion on the earth. So that was something really special uh, assignment and mandate that God is going to give to uh, uh, the uh, men and women. Yeah? And, and that, that, that is why the feeling part is very important. And he's, that's why he created men and women in his own image so that they can feel, uh, complete the feeling part that God intended uh, for the earth. Uh. Okay. When exactly is, was the beginning of God's creation? <laughs> okay. Do you want to put a timeline on this? <laughs> so there are two views, or yeah. actually there are many views. Yeah? But in regards to timeline, you have young earth creation where they will say no more than 10,000 years ago was all of this made. Yeah? And then you have old earth, which uh, they would... They would uh, they would concede to uh, modern scientific measurements of 13.7 to 14 billion years old. Mm. Yeah. And then you have theistic evolution that will also agree with old earth. Uh, and, more, and more so, they will go from the angle that God just began something, but he didn't really personally do every step in creation. Rather, everything just unfolded by creation. Yeah. So, uh, brothers, feel free to, to respond to any of these three. I would just say that the uh, young earth will hold it will, will, will hold to its theory. Young earth will hold to its theory on the idea that uh, when we discuss years, the age of the universe, we're not saying that we're not looking at a particular IC of a, of a galaxy far, far away, but we are measuring the distance from one place or another. And we are asking the question, how many years would it take for this galaxy to be at that distance if we assume the singularity is actually very near where we are. So the Milky Way is usually assumed to be the place near, closest to where all universes began. And then they measure the distance of one another. They say, oh, it would take light, not just matter, but light itself, 13 billion years to travel across such a distance. And therefore they will, and therefore they will say ah, about, that, about that time. Lah. Yeah. But Young Earth would then say, no, that depends on the speed. You know, so you say that uh, you you say that uh, that 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 uh, the universe would need to expand at the at the speed of light. What if it was faster? Yeah. So if it was faster, they would then change measurements altogether, and so they'll go behind that particular theory. Old Earth will concede to the to the time, and from the time they would then say that Genesis chapter one is not literal days, but stages of God's intervention and creation. And then theistic evolution will go from the idea that. Um, God only started something from the beginning and all of its unfolding, either he was not part of it or he, uh, or he just intervened little by little, but he allowed time to unfold itself as we know it today. There are some scholars who also believe that uh, between Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and verse 2, there's a huge time gap. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth, and then yeah. there was a break. Yeah. Don't know how long. And then after that, started the creation on the earth. They say yeah. the earth was void. Remember? In Correct. Chapter, uh, verse 2 was void. Yes. So why was it void? If it was created, it shouldn't be void. But some some Bible scholars believe that something happened and uh, that civilization was destroyed and no record, not, nothing was said about it. There was a long time gap. And then verse 2 starts with the creation, the six-day creation. So as to how old the whole universe is, I think it is quite difficult to pinpoint. Yeah. Even scientists, some geologists will tell you the rock, it, from the rock formation and all that, they count millions of years you know, yeah. in the making because of the strata, sedimentation and all that. So I tend to think of the earth as old earth rather than new earth because I believe in the gap between Genesis 1.1 and one, two. 
I think <laughs> most uh most book, uh, Old Testament book in the Bible, actually we can put a date to it. Except for certain passage in the Old Testament, you will find it very difficult. And one of uh, the first one is Genesis chapter one to three, and perhaps uh, the other book is Job. We 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 can't find a we put a date on it. You see, and it may be written very very much older than what we think. Yeah. Now whether it is old Earth or young Earth, I think is basically apologists trying to explain you know why uh, Earth happened that way. You see. Now, for example, if you are talking, you are looking into the fossil, then that will make the earth very old, right? Yeah. But uh, then if you were to take into the, the, the genealogy of, say, the Hebrew people and so on and so forth, then they'll make the world seem to be very young, you see? Yeah. So I think there's no right and wrong answer as far as for whether it's a it's an old earth or, or, or a young earth, you see? So I suppose... Uh, like for example, in Genesis chapter one was uh, chapter one was until chapter three. I mean, my take is that I will want to believe that yes, God created the universe, the heaven and the earth, and I will just accept that as it is. I don't want, I don't need to know the exact date uh, when it was created and so on and so forth. But I want to, by faith, accept that God actually created the heaven and the earth. Yeah. I, I go on that kind of approach, you see, because. Yeah. Any date I put in, uh, I think it can be challenged uh, one way or another. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just now, uh, brother, like him, said that, you know, uh, yeah, at first it was void, right? Uh, that when he created everything was void. So some, some biblical scholars say after that, there was a, what he called the creation of earth is, is called the big renovation. <laughs> renovation. <laughs> Reven renovation, renovation of the earth that make everything beautiful. I've heard that, that's one view, you know. <laughs> okay. Can but I of course, when, when, sorry, uh, yes, Tom, right, go ahead. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I, I personally think that I, I look at it with, uh, in context with uh, the Jews or how the perceived vendors hear the word in the beginning, I think it's respect of what they can perceive from what is around. So what they can see the sky, can see the earth, and see the world. To them, that is the beginning. Right? To me, God is eternal. He could have created many, many things and whatever. But God need not have to explain to us and to the Jews. So if we start explaining, the whole Bible will be huge before we talk about salvation. So to me, the core of the Bible is not so much a creation. There's a lot of things in the creation. But God has just summarized it in just one chapter and that's it. Yeah. And the context is to the people who understand the heaven and the earth is what they can perceive. Simple as that without going through all the old earth and new earth and um, <laughs> all the eating and that world. Yeah. The Bible okay. is not a scientific textbook. I think I mentioned that Correct. earlier. You know, yeah. It does speak it does speak in terms of origins with authority, you know, uh, but you will not, you, you, we do not, uh, while we do have the notion of, of knowing how, to, how all things began through God, uh, we do not expect the theory of general, general relativity to be inscribed somewhere in Proverbs. No, it's not there. Goes to show again, yeah, very thankful to you brothers for reminding us again and again that the main the main focus of scripture is to talk about the redemptive work of God, not just the created work of God, but the redemptive work of God. Yeah. That's where the creation nova will come into picture in future. Yeah. And so to just quickly respond on the follow-up question of how do dinosaurs fit into creation, <laughs> okay. you can say that therefore each of these, each of these uh, camps of theories uh, will have their own speculation as to where to put where to put the dinosaur? Where, where to put dinosaurs in? I think they all have very valid and interesting arguments, and I would encourage you to take a read. Uh, take a read on what on what they say, lah. Mm. Okay. Since no other question, maybe I just mm. throw in one for <laughs> for some uh, interest sake, lah. That's all. Sure. Okay. That's okay. Um. Now, do you think that you know human beings are the only uh, you know uh, 
life on earth or are there are there other created beings in other parts of the universe you know i mean this is just for discussion <laughs> what's your uh, 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 human beings the only created beings on earth or are there other extraterrestrial beings out there somewhere because scientific sometimes uh, evidence just shows as if the water is found in Mars or some meteorites or whatever. So uh, uh, that points to some existence of some kind of life, you know. Yeah. So anyway, it's just for discussion. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, I like the way uh, I like the way uh, Professor John Lennox of uh, he's the Professor Emeritus in Oxford and a deeply devoted Christian scientist. Uh, when asked, he once made a comment and he said, "Do you know how I know?" That there are no intelligent beings outside of our, outside of the universe. It's because they haven't contacted us. <laughs> okay, <laughs> haven't yeah. haven't contacted. Sorry, sorry. How do we know that there are? How do we know that there are intelligent life forms outside of this universe? Mm. Yeah, they haven't contacted us. Correct. So it does. It, it has a look down upon. Uh, has a look down upon us, la, You know. Uh, so in general, uh, what most theologians and apologists would say that uh, if they are in if they are uh, extraterrestrial or if they are uh, or they are other created beings outside of our universe, uh, we would then speculate that there is a different redemptive story for them. Yeah. yeah? Uh, there will be a uh, there will be a different purpose. There will be a different purpose of God uh, from God, but at the same time. We would say we would be bold enough to assume that the God that they worship, the greatest maximal being, is the God that we worship as well. Yeah, because we would say that all things are made from Him. That includes that which we have not seen yet, including uh, extraterrestrial life form, life forms. Anybody else want to add comment to that, brothers? Otherwise, there's another question here, uh, another another um, another hermeneutical question. Uh, what about what are giants? What are the giants in the Bible? One of the theories is that. They were fallen angels who have been expelled yeah. from heaven. They yeah. were thrown down to earth and they lasted after human, human, human beings, especially yeah. the women. So demons, as you know, don't have bodies. So they probably have to possess or take uh, control of another human being. Mm -hmm. And then they have sexual relations with women. Uh, the daughters of, of men. And yeah. from there, they have offsprings that were gigantic in proportion, yeah. they were known as the Nephilim. And yeah. Goliath could be one of the descendants of these people. Yeah. So they were yeah. very wicked, very fierce, and, uh, you know, they, they were sinful. They did a lot of things that were really. Uh, is pleasing to the Lord. Yeah. And as a result, in Genesis 6, God caused the big flood to eliminate all of these wicked human beings, leaving only eight, Noah and three sons with their, with their wives. Mm. And then they yeah. survived that big flood to continue on the history of mankind. Those were yeah. the giants. Mm. There's uh, uh, Genesis chapter 6, verse 4, the one that uh, Brother Tony just described. Yeah? Genesis chapter 6, verse 4. Yeah. yeah. There are a few yeah. ways to approach to that as well. One yeah. is that uh, we do know that... Uh, uh, There is also there's a discrepancy and discussion with regards to the actual height. So when we say so, like the height of so the height of giants, for example, how tall were the giants were, were the giants actually? And so 
the old calculation is five uh, five cubits tall. Uh, five cubits tall is seven foot six. Okay. You know, now for us they'll be like, okay, that means Lin Dan and uh, Shaquille O'Neal and quite a number of uh, the basketball players. Those are giants, uh, you know. Uh, but but Genesis does speak of a somewhat or, or a somewhat supernatural uh ex uh genesis of these particular Nephilim. Uh, but the manifestation out of that from what we now know to be today, basically they were extraordinary tall as compared to as compared to the average height of the day, which in those days, because of uh, nourishment, you know, not as not as uh, prolific as now, probably the average height might be about five feet plus, you know, not five and a half or five feet plus. So that will make someone who is seven feet tall, two feet taller than others to be quite an extravagant height of yeah so i think the goliath uh, yeah six cubit right he's mm. he's mentioned six yes. cubit and a span okay <laughs> so yeah uh his height now nah, the goliath height is uh, in the uh, what the first samuel chapter 17 mm. says that you know his height was six cubit and a span so six cubit is like um no, yeah, seven feet. Yeah. Feet, I think it's eighteen inches, you know. Eighteen to, inches. Put, uh, put note on. Point cube is eighteen inches. Yeah. Eighteen. Yeah. That means one and a half feet. Yeah. So six times one and a half is nine feet. Plus yeah. a span means nine and a half at least. Yes, yeah. I think uh, that it's that's uh, originally yeah, what what the Even Pastor Mark mentioned. Modern day yeah. standard is very tall. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Around around there, uh, nine feet. Nine feet. So, but actually, what's amazing? Uh, okay. Uh, coming back to what uh, what brother Tony mentioned about, uh, because of those wickedness of men uh, after the Nephilim and all that, and then, uh, they were wiped out by the flood. Uh. But then after the flood, okay, uh, what does um, you know? We feel that like everything is lost already, right? Uh, completely. But yet in chapter nine, verse. I mean, chapter 9 in Genesis, what's amazing is when God uh, instituted, um, you know, uh, uh, these words to, 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 to Noah, he said, and, uh, uh, for, and for your blood, your life blood, I will require a reckoning from every piece I will require from man, from his fellow man, I will require a reckoning for the life of man, uh, very important, this verse. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. Okay? So right after, like, everything is doomed, yet this is emphasis here that God made man in his own image and you, uh, this is a mandate given to Noah, and you be fruitful and multiply and seem the earth and multiply. And this is like, a, a, a repetition of the covenant that's given to Adam and Eve, you know, huh? all over again. So a brand new start. Again, talking about the image, like we are made in his own image after all that, that thing that uh, uh, described by uh, 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 and, uh, Brother Tony. Now everything is over. Now this is most important that we still affirm that men and women, we are made in his own image all over again and the same mandate given to Adam and now given to Noah uh, you know to fuel the earth multiply all over again I think I want to point out also the difference between Adam and Noah yeah Adam was created I think sinless and uh, there was no sin nature in him until Adam and Eve disobeyed God yeah he fell. And Noah was, is the descendant of Adam. So he has the sin nature in him. Yeah. Which is quite different from Adam when he was first right. created. Even yeah. though the mandate that is given to Noah is the same, exactly the same as the one that God gave to Adam and Eve. Mm. To multiply, be fruitful and multiply. Yeah. And replenish the earth and take dominion over all the creatures of the earth. Amen. But 
how come when they were trying to conquer the promised land, there were still giants around? <laughs> you explain that? If the Nephilim and all those wicked giants were, were exterminated and destroyed, how come later on when they were going into the promised land, they saw the, the 12 spies went in and they saw yeah. giants in the land. Where did they come from? Anybody can enlighten me? I think the giant here does not refer to the Nephilim. Yeah, mm. different. <laughs> to people who are poor and you know big, bigger size than they are not normal high. So Un unusually tall. Like, yeah. Unusually tall. Uh. It's not Nephilim. Nephilim is a special breed of giant. Mm. Yeah. Another question here. I had always thought that the seventh day of creation is in God's timing. Could be any time or many years in between. So that's what we call seven stage. You know? However, a pastor lecture recently said very, very certainly it's literally 24 hour days. I find it hard to imagine all the created being came to be in seven days. Can you please share your views on this? Well, okay. So people who hold to the seven day, seven 24 hour day, uh, notion. Uh, basically, they look, they, they look beyond Genesis and see things like, for example, in Exodus chapter 20, when God spoke to Moses and said, you know, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and the seventh day you shall rest. Because, because God, God made the heavens and the earth in six days and on the seventh day he rested. So, they would say that, okay, uh, it seems that Moses is equating one to one, yeah. Uh, is is equating one to one equivalent to say, oh, you know, six days we must we work, and on the seventh day we must rest, because God did the exact same thing, and he's and he laid for us a model, a model to follow, okay. But a few things to be said. One is that, uh, how was twenty four hours calculated? when our mode or means to calculate 24 hours in a day was not, made, was not made yet. The sun and the moon and the stars was not made until the fifth, made until the fifth day. It's the fifth day or sixth day. All I know is later. And the greater light and the lesser light, therefore, were not the sun and the moon and the stars yet, but they were basically the, the, lights, that, the lights that, were, that, would, um, that would nourish and tend to God's creation until... He developed the sun. He introduced the sun and moon and the stars to the earth. So that's something to be considered. Bottom line is, younger creationists will have this view, uh, where they will say that you know things can happen quite astronomically quick uh, within the seven literal days that God had used to create the heavens and the earth. Uh, you know, all of creation will say, well. Um, that might uh, that might be that might be interesting but it is e but it seems easier or it seems more accurate to to see Genesis chapter 1 to be more poetic because not only were the were the calculations the way that we calculate 24 hour days it was not created at the sun and the moon right but the way that God describes the day also was very different yeah uh in Genesis chapter one verse three, uh, you've got Genesis chapter one verse three and four. That's where we see the first, the first uh, handling of it. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. Normally, for us, when we describe days, uh, you know, we will say there was morning until evening, and then the next one there was one day. But for God, He said, well, for God, He said, and there was evening and there was morning the first day. Why? Well, most Judeo Christian and Jewish scholars would then say it is the notion, the idea that uh, that, uh, that uh, in the special timing of God, He works. So basically, to the person asking this question, um, there's no clear and direct answer. That's why they that's why they can coexist multiple theories. Uh, yeah, multiple theories, but we do not have. Well, no one, not one of us, has hundred percent certainty because none of us were there at the beginning of creation.
Uh, I got uh, one possible explanation for uh, the Genesis, especially with regard to the first day uh, when God uh, created, um, make light of uh, darkness. Uh, mm. No way, why should we assume that, uh, that especially the first day, one day for God, that first day is equal to 24 hours of our time. No way did he say that in the Bible, did he say that time for God passes at the same rate as it does for him, mm -hmm. as it does for us now. Uh, mm -hmm. We know from Einstein theory of relativity, if you are very near a, a source of very great gravity, time passes very, very slow for you. Mm -hmm. uh, if you believe in the Big Bang theory and that God uses the big, created uh, the universe through the process of the Big Bang Theory. It will imply that God in the beginning was near a source of, not near a singularity, a source where there is very, very strong gravity. Therefore, time will pass on him very, very slowly compared to us. So yes. that will help a lot to explain why God's seven days is actually could be billions of years in our time. Just my theory yeah. of how, yeah. how the Bible can be consistent with science. Mm. Thanks so much, Brother Gilpin. And I don't think it's just your theory. I think it is a theory that is widely accepted because even in scripture, it says one day in the house of God is like a thousand days elsewhere. So it really shows the, it really shows the relativity of time in, clo in close proximity to one who, is, who he himself is not bound by time. Because he is eternal, because he himself is eternal. Well, with that, we come to the last two minutes of tonight. Thank you so much for for participating uh, in tonight's talk. Uh, we just have a quick question for all of you uh, that for all of you that are here, and that is, we have an upcoming special talk, uh, a special talk on missions by. Uh, Brother Wiesel, what is his name already? Uh, the details. Uh, Dr. TV Thomas. Yeah, Dr. TV Thomas. Yeah. Um, yes, so yeah, Dr. TV Thomas will be coming on the... Uh, 21st February and 22nd. 21st and 22nd of February. Yeah, that's a Tuesday, Tuesday and Wednesday. And Wednesday. Like, because he's here only for a week like that. So we cannot get him two Tuesday in a row. Mm. So we have it on Tuesday and Wednesday. Yeah. yeah. So with that, we will appreciate your, we'll, we would appreciate your feedback uh, if you could let us know as to whether would you appreciate to have a physical gathering for this talk or would you prefer to keep it online for the Tuesday and Wednesday night or should we consider even a hybrid? So to answer the question to that, uh, you, can, uh, you can let us know as to whether would you like to uh, meet physically or you're open to physical to, to meet physically for the talk for these two consecutive nights. Or if you say, I think the distance is a bit far, I'm not sure about traffic, I would like to stay home and, and stay home for this, for this talk. So do let us know. Uh, so, so do let us know as to whether, which one would you prefer? Yeah. Now, how can you do that? Let me see. Um, can we do Google Form or something? <laughs> I think we can do that, yes. Let's see. If someone can design it or, or just put a vote there, just text us. Uh, fiscal or yeah through the chat group I think you just yeah through the chat group form, can yeah uh, physical uh, or hybrid which yes. one you like mm. and just indicate yeah, so for those program. of you who are with us in the BEC chat group I think I believe I can uh, I can create a poll yeah a small yeah, yeah so a I'll small a, form or something yeah yeah I'll create a poll to see yeah, and, and ask so that you can ask the question of uh, uh, of uh, of who of who can or who would like to attend physically who would like okay. to attend online and then the organizers can determine as to whether do you want to have yeah. a physical or so the poll will be through the uh, chat group is it or can you do yes. it now I or? think well let me see yeah I've been trying yeah, to because to, to, to chat group may better people. because not all I are present we, tonight yeah 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 and whoever are here are also in the chat group. So yeah. I mean, the chat group will be able to reach. Yeah, so why, yeah, so why not we give? Better. Yeah, let's do the chat group for let's do the chat group so that way it gives us all a bit more time to to respond, yeah, and okay. also ability for more yeah. people to respond because we have more people yeah. in the group than 
those who those who came here today. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So with that, thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us. Maybe at this time, could I invite uh, Brother Tony? Could you close our time tonight? Yes, yeah. gladly. Let's join our hearts together. Father God, we thank you for this evening yet again for us to come and study your word. Thank you for Pastor Mark and the rest of the panel members for contributing their, their thoughts and also their, their knowledge on this subject of creation. Thank you, Lord, for you are the mastermind. You created the world for your purpose and also demonstrate your greatness and your glory. And also, Lord, you did it not only to glorify yourself, but also, Lord, to bring joy and fulfillment to your creation because uh, you want all of us to really glorify in you and also, Lord, to, to really enjoy you, to get to know you and to enjoy you forever. Thank you, Lord, for this uh, evening. Uh, as we go from here, may you part us with your blessings and for those of us who are celebrating Chinese New Year, I just pray, Father, that there will be a grand reunion for each one of us with our loved ones. And for those who are traveling, I pray, Father, for journey mercies for all of them. Amen. Let them be attentive on the road. And then also, Lord, give them opportunities to share the good news with those of their family members who are yet to know you. So may this be a great time, Lord, of bonding with loved ones and also sharing the good news with others, Lord, who are yet to know you. So part us with your blessings tonight, Lord, and uh, give us a good rest so that we can be equipped and fully ready to serve you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Brother Tony.